Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. Technically, it's not a submarines week. It's just a submarines day. Just two shows coming your way today. K.A. Nelson is a former Marine and naval historian. He's bringing us two quick-fire submarine stories today. His book, Killing Shore, is in the links below. It's about all the U-boat operations off the East Coast of the USA, and uh, you can buy it either from the link below or your favorite bookstop. Sure, but I'm going to bring him in now. Um, good afternoon. How are you today? Hey, Paul. Doing great. Thanks. Uh, thanks again so much for having me back. Really an honor. So one of the things about your book is it's lots of lots of little stories, little stories with sometimes big dramatic um, uh, outcomes, but lots of little stories, which kind of works well for this this kind of format show. Because if you're writing about something like the Battle of the Atlantic, you know, there's years and years of combat. You can do break it down by American, British, Canadian merchant ships. But w when you were doing your book, um, and, and your research, is it a, sort of a case of finding one story, then one story leads to another story? Do you yes. Kind of, yeah, it, it very much so. Very much so. And it, it became an effort to ensure that I was I was keeping maintaining some scope control and making sure that because that, there's so many stories that are you think, oh, I really want to include that. I want to include that. So the two that I'm going to show you today were both included in, in kind of abbreviated form in the book right. because they were somewhat outside of the main scope, but they were too cool to, to leave out. Well, we'll go straight into it. And um, folks, we'll do questions at the end because it'll be a shorter presentation. The second one will be following 40 minutes time. I'm going to hand over to my next to guest to take us through this, this story. So it's uh, you boats It's the East Coast. It's a uh, drama. Yeah, very much so. Th thank you, Paul. And uh, I hesitate to uh, regret using the word cool a minute ago because th this one that we're about to go into is a bit serious. So this is the, uh, in my opinion, one of the most dramatic events that happened along the East Coast during World War II, and you're about to see why. So as mentioned, this is featured in my book, which is out in the UK and will be out in just a few days in the US. So of the U-boats that uh, operated along the East Coast during World War II, the first one that arrived was the U-123 under the command of Reinhard Hardigan. Uh, this was the, the first of the famed Operation Drumbeat boats to arrive, and Hardigan didn't pull into New York Harbor, but pulled up to the mouth of Lower New York Bay on the night of 13 January. And this started a, for him, a fantastically successful patrol. Hardigan was the highest scoring of the five drumbeat U-boats with eight ships sunk and one more damaged. And that patrol earned him the coveted Knight's Cross Award. In the 10 weeks that followed Reinhard Hardigan's arrival in January 1943, what unfolded in American waters was nothing short of a massacre. By the 26th of March, there had been 63 merchant ships sunk, five more damaged, and a U.S. Navy destroyer sunk as well. And unfortunately for the Americans and the Allies, in March of 1942, towards the end of the month, the odds are about to get even more slanted against them because none other than Reinhard Hardigan and the U-123 are just returning for their second patrol in American waters. They got back from the first, they had five weeks of shore leave, debrief, refit, and then they were headed right back across the Atlantic. So this second patrol has only, they're only just arriving to the American operational area when this story takes place. And I know I said I would do questions at the end, but one quick question for sure. you. Um, in in my experience, the kind of the bulk of the Battle of the Atlantic writing was done sort of 30, 40 years ago by a lot of British and Canadian authors. And because mm -hmm. of that, do you think the, the, the actions kind of closer to the USA have rather been overlooked in those kind of broader sweeping studies? So they certainly have been overlooked as far as whether this was say, British historians not, not giving it its due. I don't think that was necessarily the case. Um, I think it was more a matter of there was just so much going on at this at this point in the world and at the, at the apex of World War II. I think it just kind of gets lost in the sauce. So my short answer is I don't think so. Okay, thanks. So continuing on, the uh, as I mentioned, U-123 had just arrived in the American operational area. The date is 26 March 1942. It's a few minutes after 1700 
when the Germans spot some puffs of smoke in the distance off their starboard beam. This is about 300 miles east southeast of Norfolk, Virginia. They follow the smoke, and when they get a little bit closer, they find a solitary tramp steamer sailing by herself, unescorted. This was not, unfortunately for us, and for, unfortunately for them, the Germans, this was quite a common sight along the eastern seaboard, just individual ships sailing on their way. These were the U-boat's primary prey. So the sight of the smoke in the distance was a little bit unusual because most ships being oil burning in this area era didn't usually create a lot of smoke, but it wasn't unheard of. And there's a second thing that is a little bit unusual, which is this boxy structure. You can see in this picture, this is the Attic sister ship, which was identically designed. There's a boxy structure aft of the smokestack. That all struck hard again as a little bit odd, but again, none of this is, 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 is um, you know, deterring him from what looks like a, a prime catch. So they track, the, they follow this ship for a while. Uh, this, as the sun goes down, he notices also rather oddly that the smoke seems to stop and then the ship starts zigzagging at sundown. So again, little things out of the usual, but nothing that really sets off the alarm bells. Hardigan does a quick sanity check with the second in command. Says, you know, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Does this look good? And uh, he concurs. He also calls up to the bridge. They're, they're on the surface. He calls up an 18-year-old midshipman named Rudy Holzer, a midshipman uh, in, in German, the Feinrich, which is an officer trainee or essentially an officer apprentice. So there was a uh, Rudy Holzer was along on this patrol because uh, ostensibly he would one day be taking over command of a U-boat himself. So this is sort of his hands-on training. So the uh, Germans approach this ship and at uh, 2037, Hardigan fires a single G7E electric torpedo. It hits the port side hull just ahead of the bridge, throws up a huge spray of water. And it is at this point that he is pretty con pretty convinced that uh, he's got another one in the bag, another notch on its belt. But what Eric Hardigan does not know is that the fight of his life is about to mm. be. And it's at this point that I have to pump the brakes and we're going to set the calendar back three months. So these per the statistics that we saw earlier, the early months of 1942 in U.S. waters were an absolute bloodbath. And the Americans knew from the very beginning that they they were at a major disadvantage in that they simply did not have the resources at this point. They didn't have the ships. They didn't have a convoy system. Uh, they didn't even have the processes down. So they were well aware, beginning in January, when the Germans arrived, that this is going to be bad. And it's probably going to be bad for a little while until we can get it under control. That led the Americans in January to... Uh, try the idea of Q-ships. This had actually been proposed by uh, President Roosevelt himself just a few days after Reinhard Hardigan arrived in the U-123. And the Q-ship, these were used somewhat extensively during the First World War. Q-ship is essentially a U-boat trap. It's a merchant ship that is actually manned by a naval crew and has hidden guns. And the idea is to lure a U-boat in close, expecting an easy target, and then, surprise, blow them out of the water. This idea in the last war had proven uh, better in theory than practice, but um, and, and they, they did manage to destroy 11 U-boats during World War I, but at the loss of 27 Q-ships. So this ended up not having a great return on investment, but in January 1942, the Americans were desperate enough to try anything. So this idea very quickly gets off the ground. One of the most common features of Q-ships is uh, fake deck structures, usually made out of plywood or something of that nature. And they oftentimes had hinged uh, hinged bulkheads. The, the idea being that when a U-boat, an unwitting U-boat got within range, these bulkheads could fall away and then it was game on. So um, the... Uh, the American Q-ships would have structures like this as well. Q-ships also featured what was called a panic party, meaning that if the ship was hit by a torpedo, as was expected it probably would be, 
there were a certain group of sailors that were tasked to go launch a lifeboat as if they were a merchant crew. This was all designed to keep up this ruse that it was a merchant ship until the last possible minute. So the U.S. Navy acquires two, two steamers, the Evelyn and the Carolyn, and it secretly commissions them as USS Asterion and USS Attic. The photos you see up there, the, that's the Asterion up top, and below is the Attic in a former life in 1918 before she'd been converted. So in the span of just a month at Portsmouth Naval Yard, they very hurriedly outfit these ships, find the crews, uh, assign the commanders. The Attic was under the command of Lieutenant Commander Harry Hicks. The crewmen were all told in very clear terms what the mission was. It was a volunteer job exclusively. They were told the odds and told the purpose of their mission, obviously, but they were also told in no uncertain terms, if you get in trouble out there, there is no one to help. So you are very much on your own. Uh, as far as I know, I don't think anyone turned the assignment down. The specific orders that were given to Lieutenant Commander Hicks included that the, the command that action should only be joined when a submarine is at sufficiently close quarters to ensure its destruction by superior gunfire. So naval equivalent of don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes. The ships were well outfitted and, and very heavily armed. As I said, this is the Asterion, but she was laid out in the same manner as the Attic. So the main punch of these ships was four four-inch guns. These All four were amidships. Two of them were hidden behind uh, canvas curtains, which you can see in the photo here. The other two were in this false deck house with the uh, hinged bulkheads that could fall away. The aft deck and fantail had six pairs of depth charge launchers. These things were capable of throwing a several hundred pound depth charge a significant distance. And those were on collapsible mounts so they could be um, against the deck and then pop up into action when needed. There were also four M250 caliber machine guns on either side of the forward and aft well deck. So two forward and two aft. And the 50 cals were augmented by six 30 caliber guns as well. The ship was able to deliberately create smoke in order to lure in a U-boat from a long distance. That smoke on the horizon and clear weather can be seen uh, more than 15 miles away. And finally, the cargo holds were packed full of lumber to keep the ship afloat in the likely event that she was hit. 23 March, the, both ships set out from Portsmouth on their first patrols. And that brings us to 26 March, 1942, when Reinhard Hardigan has just put a torpedo into what he thinks is a very tantalizing and easy target. So he sees that column of water rise up. As it goes down, he sees that the ship is on fire slightly. As he gets closer to finish her off, he also sees that there are men boarding a lifeboat. So all so far, so good. They also hear as they get closer, there is a distress message that goes out from the ship. And this was picked up from, by radio stations at Tuckerton, New Jersey and Fire Island, New York. And the, it was a typical May Day of any ship, identified it as the Carolyn. Now Hardigan is, has truly let his guard down. This is just another merchant ship, he thinks. So the U-123 goes around the stern to the starboard side. His intent is he's going to break out the 105 millimeter deck gun. Um, or get the crew up and gun loaded, and he's going to shell it at the water line to sink the ship. This was a way to save spending, expending another torpedo, which there were only obviously a limited number of. But as Hardigan comes around the other side of that ship, he notices two things that are strange. Firstly, the ship seems to still have way on her. She's still moving forward, although slowly. That's unusual. And he also notices that the ship seems to be turning toward him. He can't quite make sense of this, and things are happening very quickly now. 
And a moment later, he will realize why, because unbeknownst to him, at that exact same moment, the crew of USS Attic is just waiting with itchy trigger fingers. Suddenly, those hinged wooden plywood bulkheads fall away. The curtains pulled off to the side, collapsible mounts spring up, and all hell breaks loose. The Germans are caught completely off guard. There are four-inch shells straddling the U-boat, starboard and port. There are machine gun bullets that are ricocheting off the hull and zipping over their heads. The red tracer rounds are filling the sky. It's absolute chaos. The Germans' gunners are not yet at their position, so they can't return fire at all. Worse yet for them, Hardigan also knows that he can't submerge because he doesn't know if his hull is still watertight, if this pressure hull has maintained its integrity. So there's bullets flying, there's explosions, they can't shoot back, they can't dive. They do the only thing they can do, which is turn tail and run. In the, the right when this engagement starts, the first bullets that were fired, or some of the first bullets that were fired, ends up hitting 18-year-old Rudy Holzer, that midshipman, it hits him in the thigh and uh, pretty much tears up, as Hardigan wrote in his log, tears up everything between his hip and his knee. He's bleeding profusely from his femoral. The U-boat hurriedly retreats. Its, it's um, diesel engines create a cloud of smoke that actually helps it hide as it sprints away from the scene. And uh, they manage to get Holzer down below decks. He's the only casualty, but... Um, he dies on the wardroom table about an hour later. There wasn't much they could do other than pump him full of morphine. So Hardigan has now sprinted away, and now his, his um, protege has just died on his dining table. And filled with anger, he goes back to USS Attic, which he sees is still afloat, and he puts another torpedo into her engine room. He then retreats again. He puts his periscope down, and while it's down, he hears a series of thunderous explosions. And when he looks again through the periscope, the ship is gone. Now, those, uh, those distress messages were received, as mentioned earlier. However, this whole Q-ship program was so secret that nobody in the Navy knew that anything was amiss until the next morning. The sister ship, USS Asterion, raced to the scene. But and other aircraft and ships came into search, but there was no trace of the ship or her 141 crewmen found, and, and none ever would be. They were all just gone. And the official the loss of USS Attic would not be formally acknowledged until after the war. And that is the end of this story, Paul. Thank you very much. Well, brilliant stuff. And we've got quite a few questions that kind of go back and forth through the story and then there may be some more coming up so i'll just throw them your way and um, the first one is generally about kind of um q ships in general great you mean is saying what if the u-boat doesn't surface at all what does a q ship do then i mean the whole plan is you need them to surface so they can put all that fire to mm -hmm. bear so at this phase of the war paul so for all of world war one and then the first half of world war ii u-boats attacked primarily from the surface it's so the, 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 someone said it because the torpedoes are expensive and they've got a limited amount of them. Is that basically it? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. Someone said in the sidebar it's primarily because torpedoes are expensive um, and they've only got limited numbers on a, on, a, on a patrol. So that is true, but that's the reason that they would attack from the surface is that they had much better visibility and they were much faster. And this was before things like radar had really made operating on the surface uh, prohibitively dangerous. Okay, so the sec second question, which kind of Stuart asked it before you did the reveal of what happened to USS Attic, but it would again a, a be an interesting one is um if you're ex if you're going out there as bait in a sense, um what happened? How do you protect yourself from a first or second tor torpedo strike? Do they have nets? Do they have uh, plating? How does it work? I mean, this is applied to both the, the Attic and and Q ships in general. Sure. So the the the, the truth is. In this, in this situation, this entire program was really born out of desperation. Right. And I'm not sure if they, I'm not sure if the Navy planners even really had an answer for that one. Um, ideally, under, under, under ideal circumstances, you'd have some sort of backup. The 
Um, the Asterion was only about 240 miles, exact, almost exactly 240 miles south of where this occurred. So there was a general idea that maybe one Q-ship could help the other one out. But I, I don't think that was even really fully thought through. Okay. And then carrying on from that one, really, um, this is about the upgrade that the ship got when it became a Q-ship. Scott is saying... Um, I assume with a short refit installing guns, there were no upgrades to the hull or watertight compartments. Not significantly. And I just finished reading, it should be here on my desk. I just finished reading this book recently written by uh, a guy who was on the crew of the Asterion. And he right. goes into great detail on what the, what the refit included. Other than stacking the cargo holds with pulpwood logs, I don't think there was anything else I could be wrong. Um, I, I recommend that book. Um, but it, the short answer is not a whole lot. Okay, thank you. And another one from Stuart Burbridge. And uh, I wonder whether U-boat crews were briefed or warned about the potential use of Q-ships given the history from the last war. I mean, my take on this is it's one of those things you you could be expecting, but they're quite rare. So it's kind of, I'm imagining it's quite low on the list of things that they would be expecting. Is that more or less right? Yes. Yes, uh, for a few reasons. The first of which being, obviously, this was this was a tactic that was understood from the First World War. But Q ships didn't get used often in World War II. The, the, the naval warfare just kind of evolved mostly past them. There were a few, and, and they didn't have any huge successes. But it's funny that uh, that that uh, that question should be asked because um, these reading through the logs of these U-boat commanders, including the ones operating in U.S. waters. They were very well aware of this possibility. Yeah. And there were a number of reports from U-boat commanders back to headquarters saying, hey, you know, saw this ship acting slightly suspiciously, et cetera, et cetera. Saw this other thing, maybe a bit fishy. And actually, Durnitz, I, I forget exactly when he did this, but at some point in the spring, I think just before the attic incident, Admiral Durnitz, who's the head of the U-boat fleet, basically told his commanders, hey, stop seeing Q-ships everywhere because it, it, it's it's um, causing you to be less aggressive. But he sort of like poo-pooed this whole idea. And then, of course, th they ended up having this happen days later, and he had to admit, yeah, okay, you do you, you do need to be on your guard. But um, they were aware of it, and Dernitz basically said, shut up and stop talking about it. Okay, fair enough. And then a question from Patrick is, were Q ships operating on both coasts? No. No, this was strictly an East Coast venture. Okay. And then my question, well, I've got two questions for you. One is, and it's one of those philosophical questions to which there isn't really a, uh, an answer because it came up in a sidebar that disguising ships goes back as far as naval ships have been trying to outwit each other. I mean, mm -hmm. master and commander and Russell Crowe, you know, there's there's deception involved in that. Um, you know, as a former serviceman yourself, do you have a feeling about uh, the morality is not the right word, but the uh, the, the the legalities, the legality of the, the whole thing? I mean, we do it. The ally, the the, the allies, the Axis did it. I mean, what, do you have any kind of feelings? Not on this issue particularly. I will say that I'm not I'm not the best versed in naval law and maritime law, but uh, I know enough to know that this this question has been hashed out by legal minds that far beyond what mine is. So I don't have any necessarily thoughts on that. I, I do on other issues, but not necessarily this one. But I will say that I know that there's been quite a lot of number of smart people that have written extensively about this. So there, there probably there is a good answer out there. I just don't have. I mean, it's one that to me, it's, it's a potential massive rabbit hole. But there's, you know, if if someone goes out you know, in a battlefield with a medic's armband and a medic's, you know, flag on, and they then pick up a machine gun and shoot at someone. That's that's clearly kind of wrong. Yes. But then at the other end, there's the sort of the um the deception tricks of camo you know, not camouflaging something, a decoy position, camo deception and outwitting and camouflage and trying to make the enemy think that you're somewhere where you're not. That's that's just how wars work. And I yeah. I assume there's along that light, that spectrum, there are all of us watching would have different areas where we would say, oh, that's a bit dodgy, you know, and it would depend on who the enemy is and what the cir circumstances as well. Yeah. Yeah. There are but legitimate then, ruses of war and then illegitimate ones. The medic example is a great one. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that should be a no go. And my last one is going to be really, I mean, obviously, this is a tragic loss of a Q ship. How did that affect? the continuation of the Q-ship program. I mean, it's, you know, as you said, it was born out of a kind of a stopgap um, sort of um, 
reaction to a to a situation that was going against them? Did they? Well, I'll let you explain. The the entire program was quietly shelved in 1943. Uh, the Asterian continued to patrol throughout 1942 and then through much of the next year. But by the time by by 1943, this was no longer needed anyway. But it, she continued sailing, and there was also a so there was there was three ships that were acquired when the uh, Attic and Asterian War. One was a fishing trawler operating out of Boston. That one also continued. Uh, neither of the other Q ships ever even encountered a, a U-boat. So they had, fortunately, very, very boring histories. But um, this kind of ended the almost ended the Q ship program basically as soon as it had begun. Mm. And yet the the, the, you know, the ally, or sorry, the Axis persisted with this. And there are some famous stories of them using your audio cut. Ships and so, yeah. It's your a, audio it's a, cut out there, Paul. Oh, so, uh, I was going to say that the Axis... But had success during their war as well with uh, with deception and disguised merchant ships. Yes, yep. The, um, the the surface raiders, which are itself you know another great set of stories. Um, but the surface raiders from both World War One and World War Two. Yes. Well, that's been great. Well, we'll basically we'll we'll do it all again in fifteen minutes time, um, or just over fifteen minutes time. So, folks, we're saying we're keeping these shows short and sweet so that they uh, they do well. Um, uh, Mr. Nelson will be back in, uh, what is it, 17 minutes for another show, another yep. U-Boat story, another Double Easter feature. story. And we'll see you in a few minutes' time. So cheers, everybody. Thanks for your Thanks, fantastic Paul. questions. Round two awaits. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Paul.